Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Amen. Good morning again. Hey, it doesn't seem right without our women of joy here with us. We're missing a lot of our ladies, but at the same time, I had a lot of the men come in this morning and say it was kind of like men of joy, you know, with everybody being gone. So uh, now I share that in pastoral confidence with you all as a congregation, though we are on Facebook Live right now, so we'll see uh, what may be seen later. But we do want to pray for them as they make their return trip home, and we hope they've had a wonderful time in worship and fellowship together. Uh, if you would, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 47. You know, we just came out of a very blessed season in our church. We had a wonderful Holy Week and Easter together, and that was followed by an awesome time in revival together. And we capped it all off with one of the best spring musicals I think I've probably ever heard. April's been great, hasn't it? Amen. Amen. April's been great. And you know, at Easter, that was the first Sunday of spring break. We talked about that. First Sunday of spring break. So a lot of people in Millenburg County out of town, a lot of our families were gone, and yet we were still able to have even more on Easter than we had last year. We had 410 people with us in attendance. Just a wonderful opportunity that the Lord gave us there at the convention center to witness to people and to share the good news of Jesus with people. And many people that you all knew, that you saw, that usually wouldn't attend a church, they came to be with us. And so we thank God for the opportunities He gives us every day and every month and every year to to share the gospel with others. Uh, of course, at Revival, we had a lot of different guests coming on all our different nights. Uh, we had an excellent preacher who was bringing the word we were very thankful for. I'm telling you, April's been great. And it's really been a great time. And I hope you have felt refreshed during this month of April. Uh, I know during Revival, the Lord certainly spoke to my heart. And He helped me to see areas in my life that I needed to more fully submit to Him. So I had to pray and I had to get serious about some things. And I'm thankful for those of you who have also shared with me those areas in your life as well. Uh, it's a blessing when God shows us those places in our lives that we need to submit more fully to Him. Because in doing so, God always allows us to experience Him more fully than we ever have in the past. And God is faithful. He is faithful. He is so good. Uh, like I said, it's been a wonderful season in our church. Uh, but you know, even though we don't always have revival, every year in the spring uh, with Easter, we, we emphasize the message of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Every year that season comes and it goes, and with all the excitement and with all the fanfare that we have, the question that must be asked is this. Have we truly heard the message of Easter? Have we truly heard the message? Through all the years and through all the songs and all the sermons and all the scriptures, has the message of Easter truly penetrated your heart and your mind? Because if you've heard the message of the gospel, you have only two choices. Okay, you can dismiss it as foolish or you can let it completely change your entire life. Understand when people only attend on Easter Sunday and no other time of the year, they haven't heard the message of Easter. Or maybe they have, okay, but they've dismissed it. And they only show up to appease family members or to appease people in the community that they want the respect of. Folks, Jesus didn't suffer brutally and die for our sins and then rise from the dead so that we could all show up one time of the year and dress nice and look nice and pretend like we care. He suffered and died to pay the price for our sins. He rose again from the dead and he now reigns as the king of the whole world so that we might bow the knee before him and surrender our entire lives over to him. 
And you understand that, you get that if you've heard the message. So this morning we're asking the question, have we truly heard the message of the gospel? Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 47. It says this, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Now stop right there. It says, Now when they heard this, okay, we started reading in verse 37, but as Kendall read for us earlier, what we're reading here is the immediate reaction of the people on the day of Pentecost after Peter had preached his sermon. Peter preached that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. That God had sent him, that he had worked many miracles, and that they themselves had crucified him and killed him. But God had raised him from the dead. And God had made him both Lord and Christ. Peter shared the message of Easter. He shared the good news that Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins, that after being buried, He rose from the dead, and that He now reigns as the King of the world at the right hand of God. And when the people heard this message, they were pierced to their hearts, and they said, Brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Praise the Lord. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your word. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to read your word and to hear from your word this morning. But God, if you don't make your presence known through your Holy Spirit, then Lord, we have nothing to gain. We pray that you would press upon our hearts to come to you today. God, we pray that you would speak to us. Lord, that you would provide a fresh word for us this morning. God, help us to know you and to love you. God, we pray that you would change us and make us more like Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. In November of 2016, you all know I'm a wrestling fan, professional wrestler Leon White, also known as Big Van Vader. There he is. There's Big Van Vader. November 2016, he was in a rollover car accident. And when he woke up in the hospital at 60 years of age and 425 pounds heavy, he was told that he was in the advanced stages of congestive heart failure and that he had two years to live. Two years to live. Now some people hear news like this and it scares them. Uh, some people become very sad. Some people are very shocked. Uh, some people get angry. Big Van Vader got angry. Right? I mean, kind of looks like his demeanor most of the time. He got very angry, but thankfully for the doctor's sake, he didn't take it out on the doctor. Uh, instead, he went straight to the gym after he was released from the hospital. Straight to the gym, he rode an exercise bike for as hard as he could for half an hour. After that, he was in the gym every single day, and he'd start with a 20-minute warm-up walk, followed by weightlifting, ending with 45 minutes to an hour of cardio, and within one month, Vader had lost 40 pounds. 
Last month, after exploring several options, Vader underwent open-heart surgery. He was interviewed prior to the surgery, and he said, I'm not sitting on this. I'm being proactive. I'm refusing to die. Now, one could obviously make the argument that this was too little, too late. That Leon White never should have put himself in a situation like this. And while only God knows what the future holds for Leon White, one thing is for sure. Big Van Vader heard a serious message from his doctor. That he had two years to live. And he immediately responded to that message by doing whatever it might take to stay alive. He heard the message. He didn't dismiss the message. And he changed his life in response to the message. Brothers and sisters, when you get serious news, you respond accordingly. And there is no news more serious, more pressing, or more demanding of a response than the news that the Son of God died for your sins, He was buried, and He rose from the dead. Because if it's true, okay, it changes everything. If it's true, it demands a response. Now again, you can respond by dismissing it. Right? Oh, that never happened. I don't want anything to do with that. I don't believe that for a second. You can do that. Or you can respond to it the same way that these early believers did. The first thing they did, the first thing they were told to do was repent. And understand, that doesn't mean that they just felt bad or that they were only sorry for what they'd done. To repent means they turned, they turned from their sins. Having believed the message, they turned from their sins and they trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation. That's what it means to believe something. You respond to it. They believed that message. And having repented and believing in Christ for salvation, it says they were baptized, signifying that they had died and were buried, and that they'd risen to new life in Christ. And then what we see them doing is they began to live that new life. They received new life, they began to live that new life. And we see in verses 42 through 47, seven main things that they did together as a part of having that new life in Christ. The scripture tells us they worshiped, they prayed, they devoted themselves to God's word, they were led by the Holy Spirit, they did ministry together and to one another, uh, they had fellowship with one another, meaning they kept each other uh, positive and growing toward Christ, they built each other up, and they told others about the message of Jesus. And that's what the life of a believer in the risen Jesus looks like. You've seen this before. It looks like this. Worship, prayer, devotion to God's Word, being led by the Holy Spirit, doing ministry, having fellowship, and spreading the good news about Jesus. That's what it looks like in our lives to respond to the Easter message by believing. Okay, that's what it looks like to respond to the gospel by faith. You can either dismiss the message of Jesus' death and resurrection or you can believe the message of Jesus' death and resurrection. And this response here that you see on the screen, that's what it looks like to believe. That's what it looks like in your life and the life of the church to believe. But brothers and sisters, what you can't do, what you cannot do is respond neutrally. And that's what too many church people do, brothers and sisters. That's what we're all so guilty of too often. Anytime your walk of faith is centered around what's comfortable and what's familiar and what's convenient and what's preferable to you, anytime your faith is centered on that, understand you have put down your cross and you have ceased following Jesus. 
To follow Jesus, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Him. That's the only method of following Him He gives us. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So when we make Easter or weekly worship or Sunday school or evangelism or anything else about anything other than Jesus Christ crucified and risen for the salvation of sinners, we have twisted the message of God. And we must turn from our sins and turn back to Christ. We must come back to our first love. When you give your life to Jesus, and when you receive Him as your Savior and your King who commands your life, you are saying that Jesus paid the price for your sins and that you have been crucified with Him. You have died. That means you live the life in the Spirit. You live a life of repentance. That means you obey God's Word. That means you are constantly turning away from gossip, from lies, from hurting one another, from lust, from adultery, from greed, from selfishness, from sin, brothers and sisters. We are turning away from those things. Because we've died to those things. You're turning from those things and you're turning to Christ. Your Savior. You're turning to the life of worship. You're turning to the life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You're turning to the abundant life that God promises to all those who would live by His Holy Spirit. And therefore understand your life must be compatible with your confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. That He is your King who has overcome death. Your King who commands your life. I want to tell you all two different stories this morning of two different professing Christians uh, two different people, in other words, who say that they follow Jesus with their life. Uh, these are not made up people. These are both real people I know. It's not a parable. not something I read in a book. Uh, these are real people. I am going to change their names, and so you'll hear me stammer and stutter and kind of think every now and then because I don't want to say their names. Uh, the first one in particular, you'll see in just a few moments why. I'm definitely not going to use her name. Uh, but the first girl I want to tell you about, her name's Joanne. Joanne. Not really her name, but the name I'm going to use. And uh, some of you have actually heard this story maybe about a year and a half ago uh, on a Wednesday night study that we did together. But uh, Joanne was a student at Western that I met my senior year, and she was in the Gatton Academy. Anybody know what the Gatton Academy is? Okay, the Gatton Academy, for those of you not familiar with Western Kentucky University, that's for the really, 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 really smart kids. Okay, they, they are still in high school, understand. And they come to Western's campus and they're able to finish up high school. And by the time they're finishing up high school, they're also about halfway or two-thirds of the way, three-quarters of the way, whatever, finished with college. Okay, so they didn't have this when I first to Western. Obvi obviously, I would have been in it uh, if they had it then. But uh, no, in all seriousness, I never could have been in the Gatton Academy. I was not disciplined enough, didn't have the, uh, the raw talent, so to speak, to be there. No way I could have done this. This is for brilliant, brilliant people. Uh, but Joanne was a student at Gatton Academy, and uh, we met her through the BCM, right? She, she started coming to the BCM, the Baptist Campus Ministry. She was very involved there. And anytime you saw Joanne, uh, you would be hard-pressed to find someone who had as much joy in her heart as Joanne did. Now, you find people who had an equal amount of joy because Christ gives that, and He doesn't show favoritism to people. But she was full of joy, and she was constantly looking to serve, constantly looking for ministry opportunities. 
opportunities. She was the type of person, she'd talk to you, and if it looked like something was wrong, she'd say, everything okay? Is there anything I can be praying for for you? Is there anything you need? Any way I can serve you? I mean, she just had a heart of gold, constantly looking to serve other people, pray for other people, uh, very loving. Uh, she was what some people might call a Jesus freak, right? I mean, just crazy about Jesus. But anyway, a uh, very brilliant, very beautiful girl. I uh, had everything going for her in the world. And uh, I went on to Duke, and then I came back to visit after my first year at Duke Divinity School, see some of my old friends. Joanne was there, and Joanne was actually staying at the BCM. They, they have some people that they can house there. And uh, she was staying there, and she was looking at where she was going to go next as far as dormitories. Now, surprise, surprise, Joanne was also in the honors program. Uh, believe it or not, yours truly was in the honors program. Uh, I didn't finish the honors program, didn't complete it, but I was in it. Uh, but the honors program, the biggest benefit that you had there was you got to stay in the nicer dorms. Okay, you could stay in the nice dorms. And for the upperclassmen, the nicest dorm there was was McLean Hall. Now, around here, we would think it's called McLean Hall, McLean County, but it was McLean, McLean. And McLean had been restored, it had been refurbished, it had a total facelift. Uh, they described it to me when I went there as the Taj Mahal of dorms. Taj Mahal of dorms. And truly it was. I got to enter into the presence uh, at one point and really enjoyed living there. Had private bathrooms, all these things. Uh, so Joanne was going to be able to live in McLean the coming year. And she wanted to talk to me, she had some questions and she said, uh, you know, I just wanted to ask you, I really feel... Like the Holy Spirit is telling me uh, that I don't need to live in McLean, uh, that I need to actually live in PFT. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Western, PFT is Pierce Ford Tower. 20-something stories. Uh, nobody, and I don't care if you had good memories there, you say, oh, I love my time in PFT. You wouldn't go back, and don't tell me for a second you'd go back to PFT. Nobody wanted to live in PFT shady part of campus, right? Real far away from everything else, too. I mean, understand, it, it, was, a, it was a dark place down there, right? Scary. Uh, but ultimately, PFT, uh, understand, that, that's where she felt called to go and live. And I'm just thinking, what about the fire drills? When you have to walk all the way down those steps twice a year, I, I would not go there for that reason alone. I would transfer colleges if I had to go to PFT. Uh, but she said, I really feel like the Holy Spirit is calling me to go there. See, because PFT was shady. Uh, PFT had the highest rate of campus crime, when I was there at least, at Western. Like I said, it was far away from everything else. Uh, things happened at PFT. And yet Joanne felt like the Lord was calling her to live there. Uh, so we talked about it for a little while. I'm thinking, you know, Joanne, can't you just walk down there every now and then maybe and still live in McLean? And she said, no, I feel like God's calling me to live there uh, because I need to know how those people live. I need to be close to them. I need to establish relationships with them. Uh, she knew the Spirit was calling her there, so I can't argue with that. And so that's what she did. She went and stayed in PFT that year and every subsequent year until she graduated. She stayed at Pierce Ford Tower. And as she was there, she shared the gospel with people, built relationships with people, loved on people. She'd stop and pray with people in the lobby and in the hallway and in the stairwell. Uh, and this is a place, you know, that, that could have potentially even been dangerous. You know, you don't know. Uh, but she made friendships there and she told Jesus about people there. She was made fun of there. She didn't deserve that. Didn't deserve that. But you know what? In Joanne's life, it didn't matter. What she deserved didn't matter what she wanted because she had died and her life was lived as a sacrifice for Jesus Christ. And whatever he wanted as her king and her Lord, that's what she was going to do. And that's what she did. Joanne graduated Western. Uh, I assume if you can get higher than a 4.0, I never achieved those peaks. Uh, if you can get higher than a 4.0, she probably got higher than a 4.0. Uh, she, of course, had a full ride to everything. Very brilliant. Everybody wants her to come and study with them. She was going into the medical field. She took the MCAT, nailed it. I mean, just total home run, blew it out of the water. That's not what she did. Today, and for the past four and a half years, Joanne has been in a foreign country, which I will not name, in a dangerous part of that country, 24-7 at risk of being killed or kidnapped and sold into sexual slavery. 
Because where she works is at a safe house for prostitutes. People who are trying to escape their pimps, essentially their slave traders. And through that ministry, she has led many people out of that life. She's led them to the Lord. She lives in poverty. Uh, she relies on prayers and donations. And she continues to keep up that work. Now I want to tell you about the other girl I know. Her name's Jessica. Not really. Jessica didn't attend church very often. She doesn't attend church very often. Uh, when she does, it's on Sundays. Uh, well, specifically, it's on Sundays during the worship service, just Sunday morning. She doesn't come to Sunday school or anything else. Uh, so when she comes, it's only on Sundays. Uh, Jessica has never volunteered for any kind of ministry. She's never volunteered for any kind of service, for any kind of work in the church. Uh, when she has been asked, would you serve in some way? Because sometimes in churches we need people to serve. We ask people to serve, and they say no. And so uh, she has said no when she's been asked. No, I, I won't serve. I'm too busy. I've got too many things going on, etc. and so forth. Uh, I know for a fact that Jessica has never, never told someone about Jesus. She has never asked someone, unless this happened last night, uh, she has never asked someone about their relationship with Jesus, whether they put their faith in Jesus. She's never sought to make disciples. Uh, she's never had any interest in that. And uh, I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I would stake my life that she has never stopped someone and asked, may I pray for you? I don't know that, never talked to her about it, but I'd be willing to bet my life on it. When you ask Jessica about her relationship with the Lord, and maybe why she wouldn't want to be more involved and come and worship him and get to know him more. She'll simply respond and say, I, yeah, you don't have to worry about me, Chase. You don't have to worry about me. I, I've been saved. I've been saved. You don't have to worry about me going to church and, and reading my Bible. Uh, you know, I don't really like the people there. I don't like the hypocrisy there. I don't like the music there. You, you don't have to worry about me. I've been saved, right? So everything's good. Everything's good. Now, which of those two... If you had to guess, Joanne the first one, Jessica the second, is truly following Jesus Christ with her life. Folks, if you guess Jessica, you're wrong. Okay, if you guess the second one, you're wrong. But let me ask you this. Which of those two would you say your walk with Christ most resembles? I'm asking you this morning to wake up. Brothers and sisters, we have to wake up. We have to wake up and realize that Jesus Christ really came from heaven down to us. That he really said he was the son of God, the king of the world. That he really suffered and died to pay the price for our sins. That he really was buried and that he really did rise from the grave and that he really did ascend to heaven, giving his Holy Spirit to those who would trust in him for salvation and promising that one day he would return and judge the world. Folks, we need to wake up and realize that nobody else has ever done that. And nobody else could ever have done that or ever do that. And therefore, Jesus alone is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of us giving our entire lives, every fiber of our being, over to Him. Now listen. You've got to remember. I used to be an atheist. Really. I didn't believe and I'm telling you right now, if this is all a bunch of nonsense, what we're doing here, if it's all a bunch of nonsense, I'm out of here. I don't want no part of this. I don't want to struggle to follow someone who isn't real. I used to think that church people who were bored to be there and who never walked the walk and who never seemed to have any excitement about Jesus in their lives were the most ridiculous people in the whole world. Because my question, if I could have asked them, would have been, what's so scary about just dropping the charade? You understand? What's scary about dropping the charade? If it ain't real, go home. And don't come back. We're wasting our time here. 
Because if this isn't true, and all we're doing is just coming and basing a whole day out of our week on this, then all this, okay, everything we're doing is stupid. I mean, it's just flat out stupid. So let's go home. But brothers and sisters, it is true. And so it's worth dying for. It's worth turning your back on everything for. It's worth everything. Because Jesus is everything you need. He's everything your heart longs for. And if you know Him, if you have a relationship with Him, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe you're here this morning and you remember the moment you were saved. You remember the moment you received Jesus into your heart. You remember what it was like to be alive, truly alive, for the first time. What it was like to have Jesus right there with you and to feel His presence so strongly in your midst. You remember the fire down in your bones when you first encountered the Holy Spirit. But you know that you haven't felt that in a long, long time. You know that other things have cluttered your mind. Selfish things. Sinful things. Worrying things. You know your focus when you come here to worship and when you read your Bible and when you pray. It's not on Christ. It's on yourself. My friend, he's always faithful. He never left you. And His invitation to you this morning is to draw close to Him once again. To know His powerful presence in your life once again. But maybe today you've never, you've never been saved. You don't have an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ like we talk about because you've never confessed your sins and asked Him to save you. You've never turned your life over to Him and trusted Him for salvation. If you need to ask God to forgive you of your sins this morning, rest assured, if you turn from your sins and you come to Him, He will gladly receive you. And God will forgive you the same way that a loving father forgives his child. But you must come. You must come. Don't linger in your sin. And don't just accept your sin and push it down and try to ignore it and try to act like it's not there. Don't harden your heart because it will only make it harder and harder to come to Him in the future. Every time you refuse to repent and come to Christ, you are saying no to Christ. You are becoming more and more calloused. Take your sin today. And turn it over to the Savior. If you do that, I promise you, He'll forgive you and He'll take it away from you. But you must rely on Him. Your trust has to be in Him alone, nothing else. My prayer this morning would be that each and every one of us that leaves here today would know for certain in our hearts that we've been saved and that we have a healthy, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And my friend, if you can't say that today, would you come and lay down your life before the Savior? Would you turn from your sins and believe the good news of Jesus Christ, the Savior, and the only king of the world. The only king who is worthy of all your life. Pray with me.
Lord Jesus, we need you today. And God, there's not a moment in our lives that goes by that we don't need you. Father, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, that your Holy Spirit would pierce our hearts today. God, help us to see how much you love us and how much you care for us. Help us to have truly heard the message of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Help us to truly know what it means that Jesus is our Lord and King. And God, help us to fully surrender ourselves to you. God, we thank you for those who serve as an inspiration to us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to follow their example. God, may our lives be lived completely and fully for Jesus Christ the Savior. And God, I pray that you would show us areas in our lives right now that we have not totally surrendered to you and help us, God, to turn it over to you. Lord, let us be obedient today. Let every soul in the house be saved. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.